Good morning. How's nine o'clock doing this morning? Oh yeah. You guys are the rowdy ones. I love it. In a good way. All right, people behind me are like, yeah, rowdy in a good way. Rowdy for Jesus, right? See, they're okay with it. All right, Isaiah chapter 40. Did you guys get a card? How about we stand up? Let's read it. Isaiah 40, verses 29 and 31. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen? Amen. How about we read it one more time just to let it sink in that much more. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this incredible promise, and not maybe it's more of an invitation to come to you, Lord, when... I think all the time, Lord, but especially um, when we are weary, when we feel like fainting, when we are going through things that are way too much for us to handle, Lord, on our own. Um, Father, may may we come to you, um, and may you scoop us up, Lord, and um, fly us, Lord, over all of these troubles, Lord. May your strength, Lord, um, be what we need, Father. May, may we crave it. May we want it. May we come to you for it, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. I pray, Lord, for our pastor as he brings the word this morning. We pray, Lord, for the worship team behind me. And uh, Lord, may Lord, may we see you. May we may we sing to you without distraction, with from the from the bottom of our hearts, Lord. May we give you all that we got this morning. And may we walk out of this place closer to you than we did walk when we walked in, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. How are you guys? Let's put our hands together this morning and praise the Lord for the great things that He's done. So come, let us worship. Oh, come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet, for He has done great things. Oh, and see what our Savior has done and see how His love overcomes For He has done great things And He has done great things, yeah And oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave You free every captive and break every chain, oh God you have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus, I see you Your name lifted high Oh God, you have done great things So you've been faithful You've been faithful through every storm Forevermore, you have done great things, and I know, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, God. God, you do great things. Yeah. And for here of heaven. You conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. No oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, I sing your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. Sing hallelujah. 
good and great things that you've done. Lord, we want to worship you this morning. This time is for you, Jesus, and so we give it back to you, Lord, because you've given, Lord, to us. So would you be glorified, God, by our time here in these songs that we sing? And for creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry and then from north to south and east to west we'd hear christ be magnified and were the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea and sky and from rivers to the mountain tops we'd hear christ be magnified sing that oh christ be magnified or we'll sing it oh christ be magnified let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody and every human heart its native cry one then in one in a raptured hymn of praise we'll sing Christ be magnified or oh, be magnified Lord one will sing it oh Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, oh Christ be magnified in me, sing it, oh Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, oh Christ be magnified in me. Strong and worship you 
And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And then when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, then my heart will still be singing and my song will be the same. And oh, Christ be magnified, let His praise arise, oh, and Christ be magnified in me, we're singing, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, oh, and Christ be magnified in me, we're singing, oh, Christ be magnified. of my life, oh, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, in me, Lord, in me, God. with me, light of the world. In light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you and hope of a life spent with you. So here I am, Lord. So here I am to worship. And here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Cause you're all together lovely and all together worthy. All together wonderful to upon that cross and I've never known how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I've never known how much it costs to see my sin upon that
So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, and you're all together lovely, and all together worthy, and all together wonderful to me, here I am, so here I am. Lord, you are, God, wonderful and great. God, I thank you that you have done so much for us, more than we probably could ever understand. And so we worship you and praise you for that, Lord, this morning. Would you bring us back, Lord, to that, that moment, God, when we realized our need for you, Jesus? God, would you bring us to a moment where we can find peace, Lord, just standing here in your presence? Would you bring us to a moment, Lord, where we allow ourselves to be open, Lord, to the work of the Spirit that you want to do? God, as we get to study your word, as we get to fellowship with one another, as we've sang these songs, Lord. We love you, God. We thank you for that privilege, for the opportunity to gather. You've been so good to us, Lord, and so we just want to thank you. Give you the rest of our time this morning, Lord. We pray for our pastor as he shares, God, that you would fill him with your spirit, God, and speak to us through him. We love you, Lord. Would you bless the rest of our time here together? We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. All right, you could be seated. Hi again. If, uh, if you're new, my name is Shadi. I'm one of the pastors here. And I just want you to know you are welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, it is my privilege to get to share with you some of the things that are coming up at Refuge. So uh, first things up is the married couples retreat. Um, it's, uh, the theme is navigating through our differences. And, um, I know that you guys have no differences whatsoever when it comes to marriage. So only Isabel and I will be there. Uh, but <laughs> her, her, yeah, anyways, I'm not going to go there. September 8th through 10th. Please don't tell her I said that. Um, she already knows. <laughs> Uh, if you guys want to join us, you could sign up online, or there is a booth right outside um, on your way out. Also, the ladies are having a women's retreat. Uh, Sign-ups are also online, or you could do so at the info counter. Um, yeah, would love it if you guys could come and be a part of that. Strong in Jesus is the theme of this year's VBS. VBS is happening July 24th through July 27th. It's for kids in their first grade through fourth grade. So if you've got a little one that you would like to sign up, uh, you could do so as well. Um, also, if you would like to volunteer for that, uh, you could do so for that as well. Uh, Sign-ups, whether it's for volunteers or attendees, um, is all going to be online, refugefamily.com backslash events. Anybody here have a little one in Camp 56? Okay, I see a couple of hands. Uh, so they are having an overnighter. It's going to be August 4th uh, going through the 5th. Uh, it's only $25, and it's uh, a fun time where they get to uh, laugh and play and learn about Jesus in a very safe 
environment. So if, uh, if you guys want to do that, uh, you can sign them up online for that as well. And my last announcement for you is we are having a baptism. Nice. Five people. Very excited. That's cool. I'll make it six. Um, Woohoo! And uh, it's July 23rd. It's the last Sunday of this month. And what makes this one special is it's happening at the beach. So the beach brings all kinds of uh, fun curveballs, if you will. But um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, it's always great. Even if you're not going to be baptized, come and um, cheer those who are getting baptized on. It is a big deal. It is a big day. And it's a day that um, for those especially that are getting baptized, they will, they will never forget it. So uh, that is all I have for you guys. Stand up, say hi to one another, and Pastor Jeff will be up shortly. Hey, good morning, Refuge. How you doing this morning? I mean, you guys are looking great as always, always. Hey, it's always a pleasure uh, to get to worship with you guys, to hear your voices. As my wife and I, we sit up here and we're just hearing voices. It's so cool uh, to do that. You know, one of the highlights of a men's breakfast, uh, and I don't go to women's breakfast, so I just know this happens at men's breakfast, is to hear the men all singing together. Uh, that's one of the highlights of my Sunday mornings, by the way. I'm here for all, all Saturday night, all three services Sunday, and that's the, one of the things that just before I preach, I love to hear all the voices of Refuge family singing together. So thanks for being part of that and doing that. Um, the Camp 56 uh, overnight, uh, maybe some of you have a fifth and sixth graders, and you saw that slide that was just up there, and you're thinking, I'm going to send my kids camping with somebody I don't know, and they're in fifth and sixth grade? I don't think so, right? It's here. It's in the children's ministry room. So if you have grandkids or neighbors or whatever, and they're in fifth and sixth grade, uh, it's a safe environment. It's all of our background check leaders, and it's all a bunch of kids their age, fifth and sixth grade. Uh, Miss Nikki, our, our children's ministry director, is amazing. She does just an incredible job. So... That's what that is, just to put you at rest, um, because I know when we were uh, going through that with our kids, we're like, we're not sending them away to camp, and eventually we did. We did send them away to camp, and it was awesome, and they loved it, but there's always that initial panic. Uh, one prayer request, and then we're going to dive in. Um, remember last week when Bill said he was doing, doing a junior high camp? Uh, it's real. He really is doing a junior high camp, and he left this morning, I believe, to Idaho. Yes, Idaho? where the potatoes are, and the junior hires. So he is now going to be doing a week-long camp with junior hires, and we need to be praying for him. I, here's what I would specifically pray for. Um, just uh, the vision for when he gets there, uh, what those kids are going through, and that God would just give him fresh anointing, uh, that he would be able to speak directly into their lives. And I know he's concerned about the age gap barrier, uh, but Bill is Bill, right? Can we all get that? Like, he's going to have a song written by the time he gets done, and... <laughs> They're all going to love him, and he's going to be, you know, Papa Bill, and he's going to be sharing with them the love of Jesus, and he's so good at that, and I don't think it matters what age you are. He is good at that, and so let's pray for him uh, this week. Would you do that with me, and then we'll dive into the word. God, we know uh, there's a reason why Bill is there this week, and uh, maybe some for him, uh, but I think a lot for those kids uh, that he's going to speak into. And I pray for, um, Lord, for him to just to let all of the concerns go and, and just be used by you like he's so good at. Uh, Lord, and would you just give him fresh anointing, fresh vision for those junior hires? I pray for life change, life change. Lord, I, I believe there's a reason he's there. He's going to speak directly into life change. And I know one thing about Bill is that he's going to share the love of Jesus with them in, in conversations, in his humility, 
and is a way that he is personable with all ages. Uh, so Lord, use him mightily this week, we pray. We are his, his sending church this week. Uh, and so in sending him out, Lord, we're going to pray for him as well. And so anoint that, those messages. I believe there's 10 of them. <laughs> Lord, anoint those messages, those one-on-one messages that he's going to have. Uh, Lord, I pray that you just do a mighty work. And Lord, we pray that same thing for this morning. Uh, people showing up here, uh, ready to receive from you with expectant hearts. Uh, maybe somebody's showing up here and they don't even know why they're here, but Lord, you're going to use this morning in their lives mightily and powerfully. So pour out your spirit upon us. And Lord, as we open your word, would you speak directly to our hearts? And we know that's a you thing. That's not a me thing. Lord, that's a you thing. And so we pray, Lord, that you would just be direct with us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let me catch you up to speed a little bit of where we've been at. We've been moving through Acts. And last week, we actually ended Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, here's what that looked like, by the way, if you just want a rough map of where he went. Uh, you can kind of see Antioch in that red circle. That's the home church that was the sending church for Paul and Barnabas. And they get sent out through this first missionary journey. And we kind of come to a conclusion of that first missionary journey last week. Just to give you a little quick insight, Paul goes on not one Uh, not just two missionary journeys. Here's second missionary journey. Look how far he went in that second missionary journey. We're talking not by plane or by car. We're talking mostly by foot and sometimes by boat. But he doesn't just go on a second missionary journey. He actually goes on a third missionary journey as well, sharing the gospel, preaching about Jesus. And we know also he goes on a fourth missionary journey, which sends him up into Rome near the end of his life. Now, here's the thing that Pastor Bill said last week as we culminated that first missionary journey is what drove Paul to continue to get knocked down and get back up again, right? And you know the song, it's just resonating through your head right now. I get knocked down, I get up again, and nothing's going to hold me down. I know, what, what in the world moved Paul to that ability to, last week we saw him get stoned either to death or near death And he gets back up and he gets out and preaches again. What moved Paul to do that? And I think as we think about it in our own terms, we think that's crazy, right? That that after that first missionary journey, let's just pack it up. Like we've got enough to, to preach on for a really long time in Antioch. Let's make this our home church and let's never go out again. And yet Paul doesn't do that. You saw it. First missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey, shipwrecked, abuse, being yelled at and screamed at, being stoned, life threatened, and he keeps going. And Bill actually said it last week. Here's what kept him moving. Here's the thing that kept him getting up and going out and getting back into this game again. Here's what it was. 2 Corinthians 5.14, and I think Bill did such a good job with this last week. Here's what he said. For Christ's love, what, compels us. You mean, Jeff, he kept going back out again, even after all that he went through because he loved the people and he loved God? That's what compelled him to go on not one, but not two, not three, but four missionary journeys? He just kept getting back up and going out because Christ's love compelled him. How many of you want that kind of love? Let me see a show of hands. How many want that kind of love? I want that. God, I want to be yelled at. I want people to put me through the ringer and me be able to go back. I don't really want that, just so we're clear. (laughs) Don't come after me and just yell at me, okay? I don't really want that, but Lord, should that happen to me, Lord, compel me by your love to love them and to love you at such a depth of love that it compels me to continue to preach and teach your gospel. I want that. Look what it says up here. He's very clear on doctrine and scripture and who Jesus is because we are confident, we have convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he, Jesus, died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. This drives him. Everywhere he goes, they have to know that God came and died for them, the love of Christ, because what he'd done for us compels us to continue to preach and teach. And then it says in our text, Acts chapter 14, if you would turn there with me, Acts chapter 14, 
It says he goes back to Antioch after the mission was complete. Missionary journey number one. (laughs) Missionary journey number one is complete. He goes back to Antioch. And we see here him in Acts chapter 14, verse 26. Acts chapter 14, verse 26. And here's what it says. From there they sailed to Antioch. Acts chapter 14, verse 26. From there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they, probably Paul and Barnabas, stayed there a long time with the disciples. Some say anywhere between 10 to 15 years they stayed in Antioch. But did you see what they did there? In Acts chapter 14, it says they gathered the church together. They said, you've got to hear this. As we missionary journeyed around on trip number one, you have to hear what God is doing. Amongst the Gentile people, no less. He's taking people who were following after false gods, living in sexual immorality, and he's changing their hearts in the name of Jesus. It's this incredible moment that he says the whole church needs to know this. Antioch church, come together. Here's what we've seen God do. By the way, he's also pouring out his spirit on people. You have to know that. He's doing miracles. As we go out into these neighborhoods, he's doing work that far exceeds our expectation. And I believe the expectation of the church in that moment as well. And so he says, listen, they stayed in Antioch anywhere between 10 to 15 years, and they kept preaching the gospel and sharing about this conversion that the the Gentiles, these unexpected Gentiles, were having in the name of Jesus. And then one day, a group shows up. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. A group shows up in Antioch, and here's what they start to say. Verse 1, chapter 15 of Acts. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren... Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, what's this say? You cannot be saved. Okay, important conversation is about ready to be had. Now, who are these men? They're coming from Judea, which, by the way, in that time, that's where the authority of the church was based. A lot of the authority, people who were leaders in the church, were down in Judea and Jerusalem, the apostles and the elders. And so these guys come up with some some authority, like, hey, you know who we're from? We're from Jerusalem, from Judea. And here's what we're saying. We're saying that in order to be saved, you have to be circumcised. And in fact, they're probably also teaching, follow the laws of Moses. That in order for you to truly be saved, you have to be circumcised, follow the laws of Moses. Now, they're not so far off in some regards Where are they getting this from? Now, they're Jewish men who probably all their lives have followed the Judea, the the Jewish law, the Mosaic law. They've been circumcised. They've circumcised their kids. They got it from their dads and their grandpas. And this has been passed down all the time. This is their heritage. This is what they truly believe. Well, where do they get that from? Genesis chapter 15 or 17. Take a look at this. Genesis chapter 17, verse 9. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be what? Circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And that shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Now, take this in for a second. We have to keep doing this, don't we? If you're a Jewish man, and and even though you've come to Jesus, your heritage, your scriptures have preached to you all your life, this is what you do to be saved, to be in right relationship with the living God, with Yahweh. And now this guy, Paul and Barnabas, they're going around preaching, just follow Jesus. And you take up issue because you know how important your heritage is. You know how important it is to follow the laws of Moses. And this idea of of circumcision is is a covenant relationship with God. Here's what they're trying to do. They're creating a two-door system. This is what we have. In fact, 
You all know the two-door system because you walked through two doors before you walked into the sanctuary today. Here at Refuge, we use our two-door system as a sound barrier between y'all hanging out in the front of the church and talking and music out there and all that stuff. And then when you walk through that first door, which is a sound barrier, you enter this room called a, does anyone know? The church religious term is vestibule. <laughs> Just say vestibule. It's a vestibule, right? It's that room between the sanctuary and the front of the church. And it's for us a sound barrier. If you grew up in the Midwest, you probably had two doors and one was to keep the heat in and the cold out. Sometimes you walk through and there's that wind that blows on your head, like, right? Right? So that's the two-door system. What were they saying? They were saying they must first get circumcised, follow the laws of Moses, door number one, and then door number two, they, they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, right? It's a two-door system, and Paul and Barnabas, you're going around preaching a one-door system. Now, you can imagine in the hearts and the minds of these Jewish followers how important it is. They have to understand before they come to Jesus, they have to understand the heritage and the history. They have to understand how important circumcision is as covenant relationship. Genesis chapter 17, Paul and Barnabas, are you asking them not to follow scripture? I mean, this is so important to us. What does it look like to be a Christian Jew? And now the Gentiles, they're just coming in. They're coming into the church and they're not like us and they're not following the rules. And you can imagine what happens in this moment is a debate and a dispute that needs to be hammered out. Something that's so important for them. Now, I want you to see this in verse two. Here's what it says. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, I want to make it super clear. Paul and Barnabas aren't wishy-washy on is it Jesus alone or do people have to follow after Judaism. They're really clear on it. So they're going to dispute those that are coming into the church and saying you actually need to become Jewish, two-door system, Jewish, and then you can become a Christian. Paul and Barnabas are clear because they've seen it. They've been in the grassroots of the church, walking around, preaching Jesus, and seeing lives change apart from Judaism, right? Apart from someone being circumcised, apart from following the laws of Moses, they're walking into someone's house, preaching Jesus, and that house has changed forever. So they know, listen, I I know this. We've been back here in Antioch for some time, and I've been sharing this with people, and now you're coming in disputing. So there is a a dissension and dispute with those certain men who were teaching circumcision. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. So what's happened here? You need to go talk to the higher-ups that are in Judea and Jerusalem. What are the apostles saying about this? They must have heard about it. They must have heard about this big discussion that's going on within the church. They must have addressed it at some point. So let's go talk to them, the elders and the apostles. Let's see what they have to say. So they send Paul and Barnabas. And it says there in the text, certain other men. Probably people who wanted to make sure Paul and Barnabas get it right. I mean, this is sort of a big deal in the church. Like, do we need to go back through all the cities that we visited and say, "Uh, well, we got part of it right right? But we're also going to have to ask you all to be circumcised, men. It's like, oh man, there's a lot hanging on this, right? That are we going to have to go back through and correct all the teaching that we did and say, well, yeah, he did pour out his spirit upon you, but now we're going to ask that you also follow the laws of Moses. Then, then, then you can have certainty of your salvation, right? Big issue, is it not, within the church? So they're sending Paul and Barnabas down to have this discussion with these men that are in Jerusalem. This is the big question. How much, if any, of Judaism do non-Jewish people have to adopt in order to be saved? How much do they have to adopt in order to be saved? Here's the journey. They're going up from Antioch, 
And they're, they're going to stop in Phoenicia and Samaria because they can't help it. They're like, we got to preach the gospel. Like this big issue is going on in the church. And you would think that'd be the only thing Paul and Barnabas could think about. But they're like, actually, but while we're here, let's continue to preach the gospel and tell people that God is winning Gentiles, even Gentiles, non-Jewish people, to follow him in Jesus' name. So they stop in Phoenicia and Samaria, and then they get to the place in Judea. And there's going to be even more disagreements and topics that are going to circulate around. I am so thankful today to be a part of a church Big C and little C, where there's no disputes. We don't fight over anything in the church, right? There's no disagreements over anything within the church in today's culture, right? Not politics. We don't do that. Come on. It's a, we, and we agree on everything, don't we? I mean, isn't that part of the church? We just have to agree on everything. Listen, what we're seeing here is all the way back in the first century, at the very start of the church, they have to face a big issue. That, by the way, both Christians on both sides had to wrestle with. I'm a Jewish follower. I think we should follow the laws of Moses. I think we should keep circumcision around. I believe in Jesus. And then on the other side was, listen, do we really want all those Gentile people to have to go back and follow the laws of Moses and be circumcised? Or is Jesus enough? I think Jesus is enough. Oh, no. We've got a disagreement within the church that has to be talked through and worked out. In Charles uh, Wint Swindoll, great preacher, teacher, in one of his books, he mentions three disagreements that I thought were, were pretty interesting within the church context. One of them was a Sunday school teacher who brought out a flannel board. And on that flannel board, she put flannel characters and the church was up and up. Now, some of you are like, what the heck is a flannel board? <laughs> the, the, I, I, I pulled the office this week, and there were two people in our office who didn't know what flannel boards were. So flannel boards were old school for us. I was in my Sunday school class. A big flannel board, big board, if you can imagine. And we would take characters cut out of flannel and put them on the flannel board to tell the story of Scripture. And it was just images and pictures on flannel boards. And, and we loved it. It was a great tool. But somebody in the church said, this is what business people use in their business meetings way back in the day. And, and we can't have that in the church. She's using tactics for business. And it, and it was actually an uproar within the church. Here's another one he mentions. Uh, the overhead projector caused a stir, right? You remember the overhead projectors? right? And it was this box and there was a light inside the box and it shined and it showed words up on a wall, right? And somebody who had this job had to keep changing the transparencies, <laughs> right? And then you go to the next song and you change the transparency or the, the teaching. <clears throat> now what happened was somebody's like, listen, why can't we just read the word from the pages? We don't need the transparency. That technology's of the devil, right? And, and it was like, no, 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 no. We, we need that. That's helpful. And there was a big dispute within the church. Here's one final one that I thought was quite interesting. He says, another friend remembered how a favorite youth minister in his hometown church decided to use a film to grab the attention of young people. So he gathered the teens one evening at the church and ran a movie for a packed house. Now, you know where this is going. Mind you, it was a Christian film, a story from a mission field. Still, the leaders of the congregation called him into a private meeting for a confrontation. Why are you upset, the youth pastor said. What's wrong with showing a Christian film, he asked. We show slides of missionaries all the time. We have pictures all over the walls of our church of, of this place of missionaries. One board member responded and said this, if it's still, it's fine. If it moves, it's sin. <laughs> Hello, right? But listen, and those are small topics, right? Those are small issues within the church. By the way, I don't think there's any small issues. I've come to find that even the small issues are big issues, and you have to work through them. You have to pray through them. They're important to someone. It was important to that man that, why are we showing movies to youth? And, and there's a sense of like, oh, his, his intentions are probably good, but you've got to work through those discrepancies and differences and difficulties. 
You have to work through those things, have conversations with each other. Thankfully, uh, we have never had issues like that here at Refuge, right? No, we do all the time. But can you remember 2020? Do you remember that year? I try to blot it out of my mind forever. Uh, but there were so many issues, so many conversations that were important that we needed to have. That, that some people thought mask and no mask, inside, not outside. Are you spraying down everything? How clear are you on what we're supposed to be doing as a church? And are you following this? And are you following that? And it was all these discussions, by the way, important discussions, because they weighed heavy on you as someone who came to refuge. You had your own opinions on it. You had your, the right, you had the right opinion on it. I'll just tell you, I can do that now because we're in 2023. You were right all along, right? But I will tell you, we had a board of people who sat around our board who, who didn't always agree on all the topics of all the things we should do this or not do this, but we prayed through it. We had deep conversations over it. And, and, and that's important, that there are some issues within the church that we continue to say, listen, we need to keep having conversations about these things. We don't just quit. We don't just stop. We don't just leave. We have conversations. And so in this moment, there's this deep, deep conversation going on. Can you imagine? They said, in order to be saved, you have to follow the laws of Moses and be circumcised. And a whole other group is saying, you don't need that to be saved. You just need to follow after Jesus. Could there be anything more important than salvation to have a conversation around and pray through and make sure you are clear? I suggest to you there's not. And so in this moment, it's a critical moment within the church of making this decision. What are we going to decide? How are we going to move forward. Now, I want you to see verse 3. So being sent on their way, they go down to Antioch. They travel through Phoenicia and Samaria. And then look at verse 4. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, catch that, sect of the Pharisees, which to us, Pharisees is a bad word, right? Even though they're just Bible-following people, the Pharisees who believed in Jesus rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So you can see it. Uh, we're Pharisees we recognize that we're, we're the people who follow after scripture and the law and believe other people should as well. We've come to Jesus and now we're saying you need to also follow the laws. We're Pharisees, but we love Jesus. Interesting, right? So this conversation is going around in circles. Look what it says here. As they stood up, these men are probably men who came to know the Lord early on, possibly, and they've been walking with Jesus all along and wrestling with this idea and sharing it maybe even with other people. You've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. Listen, I think I love this. They were given a voice. They were wrong, right? They were wrong, but they were given a voice. That, that the council that day didn't just shut them down and say, listen, not here, not here, get out of here, right? No, they actually... They actually gave them a voice to, to share their opinions. Again, even though they're wrong, right? They were given a voice to share. Listen, actually, my Jewish faith means a lot to me. I believe that people should be circumcised. I believe they should follow the law of Moses. We need to go tell all those Gentiles that they need to get back up under the law, right? But they were given a voice, even though they were wrong. Listen to what Paul says at one point to Timothy. He writes this letter to Timothy uh, young Timothy, who's going to become a leader within the church. He's going to be grown into that. Paul's going to mentor him. And he says this about these disputes. 2 Timothy 2.24. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. You mean that I'm supposed to be humble, gentle, and patient, with people who oppose me, even over the big matters of life. 
Yes. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. This is why. If God perhaps will grant them repentance. You mean the person that I'm having opposition with is wrong to the point where God is going to prayerfully call them to repentance? Absolutely. And I'm still supposed to be gentle and humble and patient with them? Absolutely. That's Paul's wisdom to Timothy. If by your gentleness and your humility, God would grant them repentance so they may know what? The truth. You mean the people I'm in opposition with, they don't know the truth. And Paul would probably go back to this moment that we're looking at this morning in our text. He'd say, I remember those Jewish people who wanted to hold on to circumcision and the law. We granted them a voice and we were humble and gentle. We listened to them. Here's what our hope was that God would bring them to repentance, that God would change their hearts, that God would let them know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Think about that for a second. And as we get in these discussions and the debate, am I being humble? Am I being gentle? Am I being patient? Am I allowing the spirit to do the work of the Lord in them, so that it would bring them to repentance, bring them to the truth, and the devil would be left out of their lives. Am I being that within the church today? I believe that moment was so critical for the church, this big decision that had to be made. Now, let me tell you this before we move on. This is a two-part message. Uh, This week, we're we're addressing the, the issue at hand. Next week, we're going to dive even further into this understanding of what it means to have Jesus alone, and all we need is Jesus, right? We're going to look at one person this morning who stands up in this council. His name is Peter. He's going to stand up, and he's going to make an argument that you and I know very well, that it's Jesus alone that we need. He's going to make that argument. Next week, we'll look at two other people that stood up that same day in that same council and make an argument that says Jesus alone is enough. So let's look at Peter and how Peter addresses this group of people, the gospel. Look at verse 6. Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, on the council, by the way, on the council, there had been much dispute, much discussion over this moment, this critical issue. Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, You know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? Now, can you imagine that day? The council is there. They're going back and forth in the, around the board meeting, right? I just imagine our board as we sit around this table together. And they're going back and forth with their ideas and their opinions. And, and Peter stands up. Peter the rock right? The one that Jesus gives the keys to the kingdom and says, go unleash the spirit amongst the people. And then he says, he has to bring this up. This has to be part of the discussion. And we studied this in Acts chapter 10. Peter says, you guys remember the day that I was, it was lunchtime and I was on top of the roof and, and this sheet comes down from heaven. You remember, we talked about this here at Refuge. We studied it in Acts chapter 10. And you remember what was in that sheet? In and out burger, Canes, Chick fil A. It was all in there. No, no, more likely what it was in there were these animals. And remember specifically, the animals were animals that Peter was not allowed to eat as a Jewish man. Animals that God had said, these are unclean animals. And all his life, he grew up with this understanding of, I don't eat these animals. They are unclean. And as a Jewish man, I honor the Lord in covenant relationship with him. And I don't step out of bounds. And Peter even says as much in Acts chapter. He says, oh no, Lord, not me. I would never touch those things. And what does God say to Peter? Do you remember? He says this, what God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. What God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. And initially, I think Peter, and as we read the text, Peter thought he's talking about food. 
right? We could eat whatever we want now, right? God is cleansing the animals so we can eat whatever we want. Soon to find out that he wasn't talking about animals at all. What was he talking about? People. He was talking about Gentile people specifically. And he was saying, God is conveying this message to him. What God is cleansing, you cannot call common or un." clean. You remember, Peter goes to Cornelius's house. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was a Roman centurion of all things, right? He was a God-fearer, but he didn't know Jesus yet. And Peter takes this huge chance by stepping into Cornelius's house because Peter said, I'm unclean for stepping into this house. I would never do it. I'm a Jewish man. I can't go into Gentile homes, but he obeys God and he does it. Because begin to re- he begins to realize what God is calling, uh, what he has made clean, I've been calling unclean. And so he says this, Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality between Jew and Gentile. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. He then begins to preach the gospel of who Jesus is, probably to a household of all of Cornelius' family and neighbors, and begins to preach Jesus. And they begin to receive him. And this is what happens, Acts 10, 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those who of the circumcision who believed were astonished. These are Gentiles. And the Spirit is being poured out on them. They haven't been circumcised yet. They haven't followed the laws of Moses yet. And God is pouring out his spirit just at them receiving Jesus. It says they were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Just like in Acts chapter 2, when the spirit was poured out on the Jews. And they were dumbfounded by it. Holy cow, what is God doing? He's pouring his spirit out upon his people. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, these Gentile people. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they asked him to stay a few days later. Now, If you remember, in this moment, which is critical, by the way, to our text this morning, because Peter stood up and said, you remember, God gave me a voice to the Gentiles. And he certainly would have reminded them of this account, where Gentiles gave their life to Jesus and the Spirit was poured out on him. In this text, he goes back down to Jerusalem and he's getting ready to share the gospel of what God is doing amongst the Gentiles. And do you remember what the council said to him at the time? They said this, Peter, we heard that you went into Gentile houses. That was it. Peter, we heard that you're eating with Gentiles. That was the argument that they had. Now, listen to what Peter then does. He recounts the whole entire account from the sheet to going to Cornelius' house to the spirit being poured out on those Gentiles. And this is what he says to the council that day. He says, Acts 11, 16, Then I remember the word of the Lord. He had said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with what? Somebody help me. The Holy Spirit. Jesus said there's a moment where John baptized with water, but we will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? as he stood before his Jewish brothers that day. He's like, I'll tell you what I've seen. The spirit being poured out on Gentile, non-law following, non-circumcised people. I saw the spirit be poured out when they received Jesus. He He goes on, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Now, why does all this even matter? Because Peter is standing up and he's making this argument. Paul, Barnabas, you don't have to go back through to all the Gentiles again and preach the law of Moses to them. You don't have to go back through and circumcise all those men, thank goodness, right? Jesus is enough. 
And, 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 and Paul and Barnabas counsel at that day. Let me just tell you, from this day forward, let's move forward with this understanding that Jesus is enough. We don't have to follow the laws of Moses or be circumcised in order to be saved. Jesus is enough. Look what he says here as we move on in our text, verse 8. So God know, who knew, knows the heart, God knows the heart, verse 8, So God who knows the heart, that matters by the way, he knows the heart of Jew and Gentile, acknowledge them, the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit just as, just as, equal to what he did for us. Look at verse 9. And God made no distinction between us and them. Here's why. Purifying their hearts by circumcision... By law, by following religious rules, no. Purify their hearts by faith. We come to common ground with Jew and Gentile here in this moment because they put their faith in Jesus. It wasn't because one was law-abiding and one wasn't. One was following false idols and false gods. One was living in sexual immorality. And God called them by grace through faith in Jesus' name to follow after him. And they were given equal standing to all the religious thousands of years of men and women following the Mosaic law. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the grace extended to the Gentiles? Now, can you imagine the grace extended to those Jews who are saying, but we've got to follow the law right? There's going to be some that will come under the gospel and realize, oh, they're brothers and sisters. There are brothers and sisters in the Lord. There's some of you maybe who feel like, I didn't grow up in church. I don't know all the rules and regulations of Christianity. I don't know the whole Bible. I I, I don't know all those things. And so then I have somehow, I have unequal standing with these people, all these righteous and holy people I'm sitting around, right? Which we all laugh because we know we're not all righteous and holy people, right? But I don't have equal standing in God's eyes, but I will just tell you, you do. You do have equal standing in God's eyes with someone who grew up in a Christian home and followed Jesus all of their life perfectly. Ha, 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 can't do it, right? And someone who just gave their life to the Lord this morning. Equal standing in God's eyes, Why? Same reason here, right? Faith in Jesus. You are made pure. Your heart is made holy and righteous by Jesus alone. Not church attendance or how much of the Bible you know. It's not made righteous by those things. Instead, you are made right standing with God. Your heart is made, what's the word that he uses here? Pure. By what? Faith by who Jesus is, not who you are. Look what it says here in our text. Skip to this one. Romans 5, 1, therefore having been justified by what? Faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of God. Look at this one. Galatians 3.26, for you are all sons of God through what? Faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on, there, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Look at this, look at the equaling balance here. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. How is that all possible? It's all possible through faith in Christ. Listen. Oh, Romans 4 is your homework. I, I don't have time to di- dive into that. But if you could just take a picture of that. Read Romans chapter Four, Romans chapter 4 today or tonight at some point and see the argument that Paul lays out for grace and faith being enough. All right, we got to move on. Now, look what Paul says to them. Verse 10, now therefore, why do you, 
those requiring circumcision to follow the laws of Moses. Test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. Here's the, what the yoke is. It's that thing that's going to cross the cow's shoulder blades, and they would hook a, a plow onto it, and they'd have to do some heavy labor, right? That they would have to work and work and work and strive. Those cows would have to pull that plow behind. So when they make this argument, why are you attaching to Gentiles circumcision and following after the law of Moses? Why are you making it difficult for them just to come to Jesus? By faith in Jesus, by the grace of God, they're saved. Don't put plows on them. Allow them. In fact, what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. These people who are teaching the law of Moses and circumcision, that's not rest. That's heavy yoke. Take my yoke, Jesus says, upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, Peter's making this argument and saying, don't go back and strap law into the gospel. The gospel is enough. It is sufficient to save and to set free. So, if it's not pulling the heavy yoke of religion, which I recognize that maybe some of you did in your lives as you were growing up, that you thought, I have to do this in order for God to be happy with me. I have to do this and follow this rule and this law and this thing, and I got to do this, and then God will accept me. He says, well, then the question is, if it's not that, then, then what is it? How does God accept me if I don't do all those religious things that I was taught that I needed to do? Look at verse 11. And this is where we'll close. But we believe, this is, by the way, Peter standing up and talking, but he's also representing a group of other people because it says, we believe that through what? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. We started off and they said, listen, you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And we're closing our time this morning Peter is closing his closing arguments with, here's what we believe. We believe that it's actually through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. We shall be what? Saved by that grace. That actually we are saved by grace and not of works. We're going to dive so much deeper into this next week. What I wanted to do this morning is get it out onto the table. I wanted you to see the dispute and the discussion in this pivotal moment in the first century church, which I believe was going to go this direction no matter what, because God is sovereign and powerful. He wouldn't have allowed false doctrine to come in. But I think it's important for us to see that there was a dispute among this. And actually, probably some go the direction of, we're going to keep doing the heavy yoke thing. We're going to keep doing circumcision, and we're going to keep doing uh, following the law of Moses. That's how you have to be saved. But then there's going to be a whole other set of people who I believe represent refuge here today who are free in Christ, right? Who've experienced freedom in the gospel of following after Jesus, knowing that we are imperfect and that we are only saved by God's grace. In fact, you people are these sorts of people right here. Paul writing this letter to Ephesians, the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, here's what it says. And by the way, this is a game changer. If you're a follower of Christ, or maybe someone who's seeking after Christ, and you maybe grew up in the idea of religion, right? This is a game changer. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 says this. But God who is rich in mercy, God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Think about that. That may not be your image of God, that he's merciful and that he loves me, right? But God is saying, listen, I'm winning you to myself because I love you. I don't want yoke upon you. I don't want heavy burdens on you. I actually just want you to come because I love you. Even when we were dead in trespasses, we were dead in sin, 
made us alive together with Christ. How did he do that? What was it? Works? Circumcision? Law? No. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, he might show what? Come on. Exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. His exceeding grace to you and to me and to the neighbor's. And to your co-workers and to your family members. God is saying, I love you. I've sent my son to die for you. He is sufficient for you. And here's why I did it. Not because you're a great person. But even when you were a sinner, I called you out of that. Here's why. Because I love you and I wanted to extend my exceeding grace to you. And then he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, this is what it is. (laughs) Think about it. It's a gift from the creator of all things. It's a gift from the God who's sovereign over all things. And he called you. He extended this gift to you and said, I want you, put your name in the blank. I want you to come and be a part of my family. Not because you were grown up in a Christian home. Not because you were such a great person, a giver. Not because you're compassionate. Not because of anything that you've done. But listen, because of my grace and my love for you. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We started this whole message off with this idea that Bill brought up last week, which I think is so critical. He said, Paul says, listen, it's the love of Christ that compels me. I will go anywhere and and I will get beat up and I will be shipwrecked and things won't go my way and I'll have a really tough day and I'll get up the next morning because of the truth of the gospel that I'm saved by grace. It's a gift of God that he's extending his exceeding riches of his grace upon me and others that compels me to continue to go on missionary journey number one, missionary journey number two and three and four. And it's the same thing will compel you and me to keep moving forward. To say, listen, there are so many disputes going on, so much argument, and I want to have those graceful discussions. And I want to be a part of the church that's going to, God's going to use to bring light into the darkness. And I'm going to get up each and every day. I'm going to be compelled by that grace and that love that God has for me. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are grace-filled. <laughs> You're a God who extends grace, Lord, to me who does not deserve it. And not just doesn't deserve it before I came to know you, but doesn't deserve it today. And yet you extend that grace and mercy to me. And because of that, Lord, what could I do other than to follow you all the days of my life? Why why wouldn't I? And Lord, what else could I do but to be compelled to love you every day of my life? What else could I do but to worship you, Lord, for who you are? God, you are so grace-filled, exceeding grace. Lord, and I believe that there are people here this morning who would say, I don't know that, God, but I want to. I don't know that truth about that Jesus called me out of darkness and into light, that even when I was against him, he was for me coming to know him. I don't know that. But this morning, I pray they would see that the works of religion and and all the things that are added on aren't worthy of anything. Instead, Lord, you are enough. You are sufficient. They would come to walk with you today and every day for the rest of their life. They would follow after the one true living God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we all stand and sing this before we go. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I 
you guys. Hope you have a great Sunday. If you need prayer, come up front. Communion as well off to the side room. We hope to see you guys this week. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.